I'm Rear Admiral Thomas M. Dykers, retired, bringing you another true account of the silent service. This is the story of the USS Squalus and of 33 men trapped in their sunken submarine at the fearful depth of 240 feet below the surface. More than that, it is the story of the USS Falcon, a submarine rescue vessel, and of the first actual use of the submarine rescue chamber, better known as the Bell. It began on the peaceful morning of May 23, 1939, when the Squalus, our newest of 300-foot giants of 1,450 tons, was on the last of her preliminary trial runs. Off Portsmouth, New Hampshire, a high-speed dive was to be the day's routine. Hatch secure, sir. Eight degrees down bubble, level her off at 60 feet. Jackson. Yes, sir. Collins. Collins? Any more? That makes 33 of us in here. All phone circuits are dead, sir. Can't raise the engine room. Telephone buoy and smoke bomb ready, sir. Release. Douse one of those battle lamps. Save its battery. Don't move around. We've got to conserve our air as much as possible. Upon diving that morning, the Squalus had sent the standard radio message to the Navy Yard, giving her position and time of dive. Two hours later, when no routine resurfacing message had been received, Admiral Cole knew something must be seriously wrong. The USS Sculpin, a sister ship of the Squalus, was operating in a nearby area. She was immediately ordered to search in the area of the Squalus' last reported position. Admiral Cole had notified the submarine base at New London and the rescue vessel Falcon made ready to put to sea immediately. He had also warned New London and Washington to wait further developments. The order had gone out, prepare to execute rescue plan. The smoke from the bomb that had been fired by the Squalus was red. The color saved for emergencies. There, sir. Boy in Port Bow. It's the buoy. Left 10 degrees rudder. All ahead, one third. Left 10 degrees rudder. All ahead, one third. There was the Squalus rescue buoy with telephone inside, and the Sculpin's crew soon had it on deck. Send a message to Admiral Cole. 33 survivors in the forward torpedo room. Conditions aft and other survivors, if any, unknown. Depth of water, 240 feet. Help's on the way. The Admiral has the Falcon standing by with the bell. Tell the divers it'll be cold work. Water temperature outside our hull's 30 degrees. And... Hello? Hello, Sculpin. Hello, Sculpin. That last big swell ripped the buoy loose from Squalus. On and all, now they're really cut off. Get ready to drop some buoys to mark the Squalus' position. At 1306, Sculpin reported. Falcon shoved off at once with the submarine rescue chamber aboard. Lieutenant Commander Charles B. Momsen of the Momsen Lung and in charge of the experimental diving unit, took off from Washington, D.C. With him, he had two Navy doctors and a master diver. Admiral Cole was hurrying to the scene aboard the Pentacook. While the cruiser Brooklyn, loaded with supplies and rescue gear, was underway at flank speed. 
the Navy would exert every strength and skill it possessed to rescue its own. Send this message to Admiral Cole aboard Penacook. Information to Sculpin. Estimate arrival squalus position 0400 tomorrow, 24th. Aye, aye, sir. Now get your spuds and anchors ready for mooring. Ready rescue chamber and all diving gear. We might as well take advantage of this daylight while we have it. Break out your mumps and lungs and keep them near you. All hands. Aye, aye, aye sir. Listen, Chief. Why can't we just use the mumps and lungs and get out through the escape hatch? What are we waiting for? Look, kid, when you went through sub-school, what depth did you take off from? 18 feet. They told us we could try 100 if we wanted, but 18 was all we had to do. Why? There's more difference in numbers between 18 feet and a couple of hundred. Like nitrogen narcosis and the bends and a few others thrown in for good luck. That's what pressure does. Then we can't use the Mumpsons? It's good gear and we'll use it if we have to. But you'd better pray that that bell gets here first because it'll deliver you nice and dry and healthy. Pipe down. Save the air for breathing. Ben Cook with Admiral Cole aboard had arrived and begun dragging the area with a grapnel. Not until Squalus was positively located could any diving be attempted. Meanwhile, Admiral Cole transferred to the sculpin. The sculpin. She's sending with her oscillator. Quiet. D R A G G I N G F O R Y O U. Anna Cook dragging for you. Chief, take a hammer. One blow on the hull for a dot, two for a dash. Aye, aye, sir. Send. We read you. When is Falcon expected? Well, I send uh, Falcon arrival, estimated 0400. Will your air hold up? That's it. Communication, Captain. Message from the sculptor. Go ahead. Pentecook grapnel caught in Squalus Hull. 1900, location void. Very well. Here, kid. No, I can't seem to get anything down to fruit juice. Chief. Yeah? I'm scared. We all are. While Squalus lay helpless, her crew chilled to the bone, their remaining air being inexorably depleted, the seaplane with Lieutenant Commander Momsen and his group landed at Portsmouth Navy Yard. They were immediately transferred by the Admiral's barge to Sculpin, where they reported to Admiral Cole. It was not until 4.30 in the morning that Falcon reached the scene, and the complex procedure of a four-point mooring could be begun. It was necessary to place four anchors, precisely equidistant from the spot where Pentecook's grapnel had located the squalus, so that Falcon could then moor exactly over the center of the square, over the sunken submarine. Working with the utmost speed, conscious of the dreadful need for urgency, it still took hours to complete the required procedure. Meanwhile, Admiral Cole, Lieutenant Commander Momsen, and the doctors and their diver had all transferred to the Falcon. Well, they're getting weak. They had to pound out that last message three times before we could read it. What's the water temperature, do you know, sir? 30 degrees at their depth, Sweden. Gonna be tough on the divers. Yeah. Who are you sending down first? Sibitsky, sir. If anybody can get the Bell's downhole cable aboard Squalus, it's Big Ski. Good. Rescue chamber ready, George? Yes, Admiral. 
We rechecked it en route. Have you asked how she's lying, sir? Before the phone boy broke loose, she told the scalpel that she was lying on a fairly even keel. List of about seven degrees is all. I hope she stayed that way. Do you want to ask if there's been any change? No. Now every time they have to sledgehammer a message out, it just uses that much more air. We'll know as soon as you can get Savitsky down there. I'm going to go to the wardroom for coffee if you want me, Vernon. Sure. Uh, look, Commander, I didn't want to say it in front of the Admiral, but wasn't there some action pending on disqualifying Sabitsky as a first-class diver? Yep. I'm sure he shouldn't be, and I'm going to prove it. H-U-N-D-R-E-D. -E Mooring completed. Diver will be aboard you by 1000. Hear that, kid? Only 30 minutes more to go. I'll handle your phone myself, B. Thank you, Mr. Momsen. Good luck, Stabitsky. Thank you, Admiral. Second Sabitsky has the cable attached to Squalus. The divers Milowski and Harmon here are all set to go. They've been down in the bell more often than anyone. Commander Momsen selected them. All right, fine. I'll double check with the medical officers. Yes, sir. 220. 230. It's the diver. He's on deck. him. He's aboard. Perfect. Put him right near the forward hatch. He's lying okay, too. Seven degrees list is all. Yes, Guy. Can you cut the wires and clear it? Good. Forward escape hatch is blocked. Wires from the phone boy when it broke loose. Sabitsky says he'll have it cleared in five minutes. Good work, Ski. Hatch cleared, downhaul cable attached. You take over, Joe. Start, start bringing Ski up. 250-foot table for 20 minutes. Aye, aye, sir. C, A, B, L, E. Catch clear cable. Everything going well? Big Ski wants to talk to you, Commander. He's griping his head off. What's the matter, Ski? Relax, Ski. No matter how impatient you get, you're coming up by the tables. I want you ready to dive again, not sitting in the chamber fighting the bends. <laughs> okay, so you're the strongest guy in the whole Navy. You're still coming up by the tables. Hold him at 90 feet for 10 minutes more. Aye, sir. 
Depth 100 feet, all okay. Now, if there's anything you don't understand, why just stop me. And you can pass this along to all the other newsmen on your tug. Now, that wire with the diver attached to the forward escape hatch of Squalus is the downhaul cable. Now, there's a winch in the bottom of the bell, operated by compressed air from inside, that hauls the bell right down until it lands on the sub. Then they open the submarine hatch, they take aboard six or seven men, close the hatch, undo the holding down rods, reverse procedure, and float up. Uh, the bell can then make the trip between the sub and the surface, just like an elevator, if everything goes according to the book. It's the bell. They're boarded. Man, that sounds good. Going to the lower compartment, sir. Everything is normal. Bielowski's attaching the holding down rod. This one's in place. Bielowski's opening the hatch. Hello, here we are. Glad to see you. Glad you dropped in. What took you so long? Can you use some hot coffee? Yeah. We're going to take the first six men aboard us now, sir. I got something you probably want even more. Open the valve. Give these people some of that high-class fresh air. that afternoon, 29 hours after the accident, the first six men from the Squalos were brought up and taken below for medical care and attention. The bell had proven itself an actual rescue, but there was no time for self-congratulation. There were still 27 men aboard the Squalos. Shortly after 8 o'clock that night, the bell began its final ascent. It was carrying the Squalus captain and the last seven survivors. Hold it! Bell's stuck at 160 feet. Try your downhaul. Maybe that'll clear it. All right, stand by, McDonald. Downhaul cable's fouled on the motor drum. They can't release it to rise or rewind it to clear. Why can't a diver come down and just cut it free? Then we can float up to the surface. Float? Go up like a rocket. And you figure out what would happen if we'd smash into the Falcon's hull. Well, if they can't do it, we'll have to do it for them. All right, sweet, tell them to flood their ballast tanks. As soon as they sink to the bottom, we'll have a diver down there to detach that foul cable. That'll mean trying to haul them up by the preventer wire. And that's only a guideline. It was never meant to take a load like that. I know that. But it's the only chance. There's no choice. Aye, aye, sir. Flood your ballast tanks, McDonald. We're sending a diver down to detach that cable. Helmet on, squires. And hurry! By the time you get below, they'll be on the bottom water. Detach their downhaul cable and we'll try to bring them up with the preventer wire. Okay, up and over. Wire says the cable's too taut, he can't detach it. All right, send them down our biggest mechanical wire cutters, on the double. You think you'll be able to cut it, sweet? I hope so, sir. If any man's got the strength to do it, Squires is the man. Okay, Waller, he's got the cutters. I can hear him panting. Squires is trying to cut the cable, Mac. They can hear him working outside the bell.
Good work, Walter. He cut it. All right, bring Walter up to 90 feet. And be very careful to keep him away from the preventer wire. Those preventer wires are awfully thin. I know, sir. Well, here goes. Well, so far, so good. Sweet! Look! I see it. Fast teaming, hold it! It's the winch. There's too much strain on that wire. We lower them again, by hand. I'll send another diver down, try to reave a new cable and shackle it onto them. McDonald, can I give you the word? Aye, aye, sir. Flood negative, very slowly. When you give the word, you're lowering away. Until we're on the bottom again. Right. Two divers attempted to attach a new cable. Both attempts failed. By now, the rescue chamber and its final load had been submerged for over four hours. Want me to send down another man, sir? Try again? No, sweet, no, it's hopeless. You know, they can't take much more of this. How are the men holding out? Believe it or not, sir, they're singing. The what? Man, this is Admiral Cole. <laughs> Admiral Cole? <laughs> hey, hey, my God, how was it, Seattle? Aye, aye, sir. They're going to try to haul us up with a bad wire. It's the only way. Pull up the tank. Give minimum strain. Below five seconds, Mac. The trick was to lighten the rescue chamber just enough by blowing ballast so that it could be hauled up by manpower alone. In this way, it was hoped that a parting strain would not be placed on the seriously weakened preventer wire. The Falcon's crew hauled away, steadily, evenly, to prevent jerks as the chamber was hauled off the bottom. The cable came in, but until that bad section of wire was aboard, the situation would be critical. The lives of ten men hung literally by a thread. Three sections inboard. It's passed. Yep. One o'clock in the morning, the last of the rescued men was safely aboard the Falcon. This was an epoch-making triumph for the United States Navy. Thirty-three men had been saved from what would have been almost certain death before the invention of the rescue chamber. I'll be back in a moment with our special guest. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Vice Admiral Charles B. Momsen, retired, one of whose most memorable exploits you have just seen. Good to have you with us, Admiral. I'm very glad to be here, Tommy, and I got a real kick out of your accurate reenactment of those hectic hours. As the inventor of the famous Momsen lung, and as the officer in charge of the experimental diving unit that made so many pioneering discoveries, I know that you dedicated a large part of your long and distinguished naval career to rescue work. But I imagine that the saving of those aboard the Squalus must have been one of the greatest moments of that career. You're right, Tommy. I can't recall anything that ever gave me greater satisfaction. But let's not make it sound like a one-man job. You know that literally hundreds of men cooperated magnificently in making it possible. All hands certainly deserve the highest praise. And I'm sure that our viewers would be interested to learn from you what subsequently happened to the Squalus. Salvaging the sunken submarine was a long and difficult task, but we finally raised her. When she was recommissioned, her name was changed to Sailfish, and she went on to hang up an outstanding war record in combat. One final fact I think is well worth mention, Admiral. All of the 33 officers and men who were rescued from the Squalus when offered their choice of further assignments in the Navy, chose unanimously to remain in submarines. I don't think we could find a greater tribute to the submarine service. Yes, sir. After our many enjoyable years in the boats, I'm sure we won't have any trouble agreeing that they made the right choice. It's been an honor to have you with us, Admiral Momsen. Thank you. We hope you'll be aboard again when we bring you another true account of the silent service. Through the deep blue underneath the ocean, we'll control the 